So back in like 2015, this was like my junior year of high school, my history teacher came into class one day and he was like, guys, they're making a hip hop musical about Alexander Hamilton. And we were all like, that sounds like the most horrible shit I've ever heard. Who would, who would want to listen to that? And here we are. I think it's safe to say that over the last, I don't know, five years or so, all of the stars have aligned for Lin-Manuel Miranda. If you somehow don't know who he is, he is a songwriter, playwright, and producer, known mostly for his massively successful Broadway hit, Hamilton. Lin is a generational talent. Born in New York City in 1980 to a Puerto Rican-American family, he got involved in musical theater at a young age and very clearly pulls a lot of Latin and hip-hop influences into his work. This is very evident within his first musical, In the Heights, the story of a Dominican-American working-class community set in Washington Heights. In the Heights is sort of an underappreciated success, although it did get a relatively well-received Broadway run, and most recently a flashy film adaptation, which we'll talk about a little later. But the real success for Lynn came in 2016, when his musical Hamilton came to Broadway after a well-received off-Broadway run. The musical is a hip-hop inspired story about Alexander Hamilton, following him as the main character throughout the American Revolution and the formation of the United States government. Throughout the story, he interacts with a number of other historical figures, including George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and his adversary Aaron Burr, who ultimately becomes culpable in his death in a duel at the end of the show. So here's my opinion on Hamilton. I've seen it live, I still think it's very good. I think the standout aspect of it is obviously the music because the show is entirely sung through, there's virtually no lines in it that aren't sung or rapped. And the way the rap is used throughout the score to convey the story beats is honestly really impressive. Even the more traditional musical theater songs and ballads are really unique and well done. Certain numbers from the show have a lot of replay value for me and plenty of other people to this day. And the original cast is just fantastic. Leslie Odom Jr., David Diggs, and Philippa Sue, among others, played a huge part in making the original production the juggernaut that it was. The framing device of the show, being that these historical figures who are slave owners and colonizers are being portrayed by actors of color, has received some criticism over the years, both by dumb bigots who don't understand how casting works, and by people with actual good points and analytical arguments who are significantly more equipped to speak on that subject than me. Here are some places to start if you're curious. But at the time Hamilton debuted, this was super groundbreaking. Additionally, the show sort of hit at the right time politically, as many tend to associate it with Obama-era optimism. After all, Lynn performed the musical's opening number at the White House years before the full show even existed. Get your education, don't forget from whence you came. And the world is gonna know your name. What's your name, man? Alexander Hamilton. His name is Alexander Hamilton. And there's a million things he hasn't done. But just you wait. Just you wait. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that Hamilton at its peak became synonymous with the Obama-Clinton Democrat machine in 2016. Lynn was constantly performing at political events and the entire apparatus was basically an extension of the Hillary Clinton campaign. You need to do, Number one. you register to vote and it's on. You post that Hillary sign up on your lawn. Number two, call some undecideds with your crew. Your cousins in Ohio maybe try and flip them blue. The show during this time represented cheery optimism about the best of what America had to offer, while seemingly ignoring a lot of what made America ugly. But we didn't have to think about that. We were about to have our first woman president, and the biggest debate going on was whether or not to call Bill Clinton the first gentleman or something else. And then... Dana, you, were, you wanted to be precise, so go ahead. That's right. Uh, CNN can report that Hillary Clinton has called Donald Trump to concede the race. Hamilton's place in the world after the election of Donald Trump became different. The work became more of a resistance cry for certain groups of people, and whether or not it really had the right to be one was certainly debatable. But the cultural critique over Hamilton and by extension Lin-Manuel Miranda's place in the cultural conversation at large didn't come until much later because at this point there were bigger fish to fry. One thing's for sure though, Hamilton made a lot of money throughout this time. It cleared all of the major Tony awards and getting to the Richard Rodgers to actually see the damn thing was virtually impossible if you weren't extremely wealthy. People 
were busting down the doors to see the show, which is a once in a generation sort of phenomenon for something as dorky as a Broadway musical. Contrast this with several years later, as Hamilton became more accessible in multiple ways. Prices for the show eventually did come down, which is how I was able to see it with my family in 2021, right after Broadway had opened back up again. Additionally, the musical could be enjoyed and accessed in the comfort of people's homes during the pandemic, as Lin-Manuel Miranda allowed the pro shot to be distributed on Disney+, Plus, which likely made Disney a lot of fucking money. Hamilton's critical and commercial success propelled Lin-Manuel Miranda to the spotlight and in the crosshairs of many media companies who were looking for musical projects to develop. Which is just funny in itself because even though Lin was the leading man in Hamilton, he's not a typical leading man. If you put him up against any of the original cast members of Hamilton or even the actors who replaced him on Broadway as Alexander, he really is lacking in the vocal department, but everyone gave him a pass because of his skills in the writing and rapping and composing. So by this point, Lin had a lot of public visibility. He proved himself to be a hit maker and he already had ties to Disney with the aforementioned release of the Hamilton Pro Shot on Disney+. Plus. So basically over the last three years, he's become Disney's guy. And that has achieved rather mixed results as far as his reputation goes. So before we get into the Disney stuff, I just wanted to take a minute to talk about Tick Tick Boom, which is the movie that Lin-Manuel Miranda directed about Jonathan Larson, who created Rent. Uh, the movie came out in 2021. It is a musical and it is fantastic. I didn't know like where else to put it in this video, but I really wanted to talk about it because it is a movie that I love and also it is a movie that my boyfriend Brian loves and I asked him about it and him and I basically have the same opinion about it so I'm gonna play that for you now here we go Brian what thoughts on Tick Tick Boom go um it's one of the best um movie musicals I think maybe ever made definitely in the last like 20 years top five uh, um Linda Miranda directed the shit out of it and that's like probably the best thing he's done by far since Hamilton it's the one thing I like don't dislike and I, I love I appreciate him for Tick Tick Boom and Hamilton I did not see in the Heights uh, Andrew Garfield's amazing um, he should be he should focus his energy on directing more movie musicals not writing terrible songs in Disney live-action remakes <sighs> I have the same opinion as- like, I was gonna say my opinion, but that's also my opinion. Sorry. No, it's okay. You did a good job. Do you still get, like, the YouTube money? For what I say? Yeah, that's how this works. Okay. Cool. I'll buy you dinner, though. Sweet. <laughs> Okay, so Lin-Manuel's first shit or get off the pot moment came in 2016 with the development of Moana, which he was actually hired to work on two years prior. And he definitely did deliver. How Far I'll Go, the classic I Want song in the film, won a ton of awards and was very well received overall. Additionally, it was the first time that you could directly see his very specific influence in the song You're Welcome, performed by Maui, played by Dwayne The Rock Johnson. The song is catchy and fun, and it most notably has a Hamilton-style section of rap. And upon first listen, many fans who now knew Hamilton at this point were like, oh yeah, that's cool, he's doing the Hamilton thing. And surprisingly, Dwayne The Rock Johnson actually performed the whole bit pretty well. Overall, Miranda's influence on the project was more of a fun novelty than anything else. But the real kingmaker came a few years later with Encanto. So the thing about Encanto is that it has a paper-thin plot. The whole story, if you lay it out, doesn't make much sense. However, the movie has a lot of charm to it, a lot of unique charm. There's a lot of really cool character design and there's a reason why people gravitate to it. And I think it would actually make like a really good like mini series on like Disney Plus or something. I think like if they want to do more Encanto stuff that that's like what they should do. But the main thing that people gravitated toward with Encanto and I think one of the big reasons it became the phenomenon that it did was because of the music. We Don't Talk About Bruno was an inescapable hit for a full year. This tends to be forgotten about due to other events, but the song was performed at the Oscars the year that the movie was released, even though it wasn't the Encanto song that got nominated for an Oscar. And here's the thing, when you run it back and listen to it, it's easy to understand why it became so popular. The thing is a total earworm. It has a lot going on, a lot of characters, a lot of really catchy melodies throughout. It has the fun, fast-talking rap section performed by Delores, 
Taurus, which is just magnetic, and the song culminates in this interesting layering of all of the different motifs on top of each other. It very much reminds me of the end of Nonstop in Hamilton. The cultural context of Encanto also lends itself quite a bit to Lin-Manuel Miranda's style of musical score and production. It's got a lot of quirky characters, which is why Bruno's little fast rap part at the end, performed by John Leguizamo, works pretty well. Although it's evident by this point that some of these little rap verses are starting to sound very samey. Additionally, Encanto is a movie that is very much inspired by Latin culture and tradition, so Miranda's influence in the music makes a lot of natural sense. Here's where we run into the issue. Disney has an extensive backlog of iconic music for many of their films, especially their animated classics. And Disney, especially recently, has a tendency to not leave well enough alone, as they insist upon desecrating the legacy of their original masterpieces by shitting out soulless live-action remakes. Sometimes they decide to take out the music altogether, which is certainly a choice, but one of their more recent choices for the live-action remake of The Little Mermaid was to include the original works from the original film, and then basically have Lin-Manuel Miranda fill in the gaps. And this doesn't work if you're already working within the confines of a pre-existing score, because the last thing that The Little Mermaid needs is a fast-paced rap that seems like it's running away from itself as it happens, and yet... Hey, Brian. Yeah? What do you think you're doing here right now? You didn't tell me. <laughs> I didn't tell him. Um, so I want to just, like, get your reaction to, like, this, this like, piece of music that I found that's, like, absolutely fine. <laughs> okay. That's, like, absolutely fire. <laughs> like, I'm just gonna... It's fire? Yeah, it's fire. <laughs> it's fire. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I... <laughs> I told you I never wanted to hear this again after we saw the movie. He's not gonna do that. No. No. So thoughts on Scuttlebutt? thoughts genuinely <laughs> brought the movie down so much Lin-Manuel Miranda needs to be stopped and the sooner we stop him the better I don't know I think it was pretty fire personally no you did <laughs> So this song has brought Lin back to the spotlight yet again, with many people eager to take shots at him for doing this in every Disney production that he's been a part of. And with the two examples I gave earlier, Moana and Encanto, it wasn't quite as noticeable. But this bordered into unforgivable territory for some people, and is that fair? I don't know. I mean, you can't say he doesn't have range, he has created songs for other projects that don't sound like this. Maybe some studio exec asked him to create Scuttle's song in this style and that's what he did. But I think this is dangerous territory for him as the more poorly these style songs are performed in these movies, the worse it's going to reflect on him and appear more like a gimmick. And anytime something goes wrong with a modern day Disney movie involving music, he more often than not becomes the scapegoat for what fans of these re adapted or postmodern original works don't like about them. For example, the removal of the body language line in Ursula's iconic Poor Unfortunate Souls number rubbed people the wrong way, myself included, and Lin got a lot of shit for that creative choice even though it may not have necessarily been his doing. But in a lot of ways he has become synonymous with what people, especially Gen Z, dislike about the movie and theater industry and the way those things intersect while millennials seem to hold him in much higher regard for his previous work, a cringe purgatory, if you will. Lin has also taken sort of a secondary character arc on TikTok where Gen Z teens like to make fun of him and his mannerisms, and I mean, once you have a dedicated impression guy of you, you're kind of just losing the war permanently. I am Cinderella, I am a style of my own, and I will not change it for you. 
And this conversation, of course, doesn't just stop at Disney. Outside of his work with the mouse, Lin has done a handful of other projects, and with those projects has come an equal mix of adoration and controversy. When In the Heights came out in 2021, Lin took a lot of flack for the casting of the film due to a lack of representation for darker skin Afro-Latino characters on screen. Lin acknowledged that criticism with the following statement. I hear that, without sufficient dark-skinned Afro-Latino representation, the world feels extractive of the community we want so much to represent with pride and joy. In trying to paint a mosaic of this community, we fell short. I'm truly sorry. Additionally, he came under fire after bringing Hamilton to Puerto Rico following the devastation of Hurricane Maria because of his passionate advocacy for the PROMESA Act. The PROMESA Act, also known as the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, was a 2016 federal law that was seen as a means of debt relief for the island. The act gave way to a fiscal oversight board comprised of seven U.S. appointed, not Puerto Rican elected members, and ended up issuing a lot of budget cuts, and many argue that the act did more bad for the island than it did any good. Here's an article about it if you want to read more, I'll link it in the description down below. And of course, things really came full circle back in 2020 following the murder of George Floyd when Cancel Hamilton began trending online around the time that the pro shot was released. Critics of the musical had called out Lynn for the fact that the show tends to overtly glorify some characters who are slave owners. Lynn responded to that backlash with this statement. All the criticisms are valid. The sheer tonnage of complexities and failings of these people I couldn't get or wrestled with but cut. I took six years and fit as much as I could in a 2.5 hour musical. Did my best. It's all fair game. So what's the takeaway here? I guess it's that once you make a cultural phenomenon like Hamilton, everything you do is going to be scrutinized under an intense lens forever and ever, and different groups are going to be frustrated at you, whether you're being called out for a lack of representation or historical accuracy in your work, or you're getting too much of a pass on your mediocre singing skills despite being a prominent fixture on Broadway, or you made Aquafina rap and that's just too much of a mortal sin for anyone to bear. I give Lynn credit for dealing with all of his criticisms and public shortcomings in a good enough way because it very easily could have gone the direction of him losing his mind and having a manic episode and jerking off in the street like the Coney 2012 guy. Love him or hate him, Lin-Manuel Miranda is going to be a fixture of pop culture going forward. And he's got the musical talent and he seems like a nice enough guy. So is it the worst thing in the world that he's going to be heavily involved in the things we watch and listen to or is he just a little cringe and can we forgive that? I don't know. I'm sure you'll let me know in the comments, and while you're down there, tell me what your favorite ice cream flavor is. Mine is cookie dough. See you next time. Bye!